Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE, live here in Palo Alto, California, and in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante for a special coverage, Emergency Cube and Cube Research Analysis on the big enterprise tech news. Today we're going to delve into the major development where Hewlett Packard Enterprise HPE has announced the acquisition of Juniper Networks, a leader in AI native networks, in an all cash deal valued at approximately 14 billion. This strategic move is set to reshape the landscape of the cloud and AI native networking market, enhancing HPE's edge to cloud capabilities. Dave, we're going to explore the deal's industry, technology, product, and financial aspects for Juniper. Shareholders will receive $40 a share, representing a significant premium. Dave, first I want to walk through with you the research piece of it as the chief research officer and CUBE co-host for 13 years, um, heading up the new CUBE research with Wikibon, uh, formerly Wikibon with Rob, Stretche and Shelly Kramer. Dave, it's been interesting news to unpack here and the reaction from the community we're going to have right after this will be telling, this is a big deal. Yeah, you know, I mean, Antonio Neri has been aggressive but conservative with, with acquisitions since he took over. And what I mean by that is he's pretty much made sure that the, the, the acquisitions are going to give good return, done a lot of tuck-ins. Uh, he didn't do the Aruba acquisition, but he was certainly there at the time. So this is a big, big number for HPE to absorb. HPE was doing really well in networking. And I, you know, as we'll show in some of the data, you know, Juniper was kind of having to figure out what to do next, hitting a little bit of a wall from a growth standpoint. But I wonder if we could bring up the data from ETR, Andrew, the first slide here. Um, and it shows the net score or spending momentum on the vertical axis and the presence or pervasiveness in the data set. This is a survey of 1700 IT uh, decision makers. That's on the horizontal axis, that presence in the data set. Anything at or near that 40% mark or that red line is considered highly elevated. So breaking this down a little bit, you see Cisco's the big whale. Everyone wants a piece of their business. They're the king of networking. They got a large business, as you can see in the X dimension. They also own Meraki, the simplified sort of management solution, which you can see has very, very strong momentum in the market, as does Aruba, which is HPE's networking crown jewel. Now the ETR data shows that also shows HPE, which is probably just customers saying, yeah, we use HPE networking, could be the legacy 3Com asset. And you see Juniper, which is kind of stuck with a net score in the low single digits. Its revenue was basically flattish last year. Um, and so, it, but it's got a security business. It's got some AI assets that HPE can leverage. And you put these three data points together and it doubles HPE's networking business, John, as you said, to around 10 billion. It gives it a formidable asset to keep penetrating the market and, and going after Cisco. You can see Arista's in there too, Extreme Networks. Uh, Risco's got, got great momentum, but obviously much smaller. Yeah, we're going to have our panel come in and dissect the impact, but I looked at that graph and it's clear, you know, Cisco, obviously the big, the big player, but if you look at the market, Dave, and you look at the technology synergy between HPE and Juniper in this deal, particularly how their combined portfolios can put innovation back at the center of HPE strategy, specifically in AI and cloud native environments. This acquisition is expected to double HPE's networking business, creating a formidable position play against Cisco and others. Well, um, can, let's, what, what is your take on, and what data do you have that, that looks at the broader market implications, specifically the impact to the numbers? Can you share the data on what the combination looks like? Okay, it's going to double the business. What does that mean financially? Because a lot of people yeah. are questioning the math here, and, and I said I love this deal, the math looks great. I mean, this, the networking is the hottest area that nobody's talking about in technology. Yeah, so we got to, we put together some a quick financial snapshot, Andrew, if you'd bring that up, of, of some of the players that we showed earlier. So what we show here is trailing 12 month revenue, last quarter's growth rate, which is kind of overstated for Juniper at double digits, trailing 12 month gross margin, TTM operating margin, market cap, revenue multiple, headcount, and revenue per employee. And the, the takeaway here is John, as you just mentioned, Cisco's the big player. They got a $60 billion business that everyone wants a piece of. And you can see how the market rewards Arista's growth rate. They got a 14X revenue multiple and its margin profile is similar to Cisco. So high margin, high growth for Arista Extreme, you got kind of a niche player. But if Andrew, if you go to the next slide and you isolate on HPE, mm -hmm. Juniper and Cisco, you can see why this deal makes financial sense in my opinion, John. Yeah. HPE is picking up a quality $5 billion plus revenue asset. It's going to have okay growth. 
you know, higher or comparable to HPE's, it's higher than HPE's gross margin overall and better operating margin. This should be accretive, I would think within a year. And HPE is undoubtedly gonna find some go-to-market and service synergies as well as leverage Juniper's AI, its security assets. So my bottom line is, to me, John, this makes sense from a financial perspective and is only going to bolster the quality of HPE's earnings. Can you explain what does it mean again? Because I think the numbers speak to us. If you go back to the original slide, Andrew, with all the, the sector players, because Arista's got great numbers, Dave. Dave, this analysis with Arista, why isn't Arista, I mean, their numbers look fantastic. Why, why I mean, obviously HPE and Juniper combined puts, I can see how you put it in Cisco, but what does this slide tell you about the overall networking industry? Arista's got great metrics. Look at those numbers. Unbelievable. I mean, look at the revenue multiple. Look at how the street rewards the execution Go that Jay Shri Ulal. You know, Jay Shri is obviously, I mean, she, she's like a business hero of ours, John. She's been to the Cube a number of times. She's an amazing operator. But look at the, the asset that they've built. They're around the same, from a trailing 12 month standpoint, around the same size as Juniper. But, but look at the revenue multiple and the valuation that they're getting. So they got, they're running at 44% growth last quarter. And they got a, 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 a market cap that's you know 78 billion. I mean that is amazing execution. Uh, a very well run company. Their their revenue per employee is very strong. So, you know the market will reward still rewards growth despite all this you know focus on interest rates and 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 valuation. Maybe Arista could have bought Juniper. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure it would need to. I mean, I, I mean it's it, 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 in a way, you know, uh, Juniper. Look at for, for HPE. Juniper lifts the, the quality of HPE's financials, whereas Arista, you know, it would actually dilute them. So I, I think from HPE's standpoint, this makes a lot of sense. Well, both CEOs at Juniper and uh, HPE, both CUBE alumni, we've sat down with them many times, Dave, and, and had a chat. What I found interesting is that, remember, we were really bullish on Aruba, but over the past few years, there's been a lot of um, industry discussion around some product gaps. Okay, so I asked them directly this morning on the analyst call um, what those gaps were and did they have a position in silicon? Well, Antonio lit up like a, like a tree, Christmas tree, like, oh yeah, we got all this great stuff. And Rami has started his career in silicon. I had that story in theCUBE. So the, the question is going to be is where does HPE compete in with the, the combination of Juniper? Because you know, HPE has, has had a portfolio of networking, okay? Juniper's had the world-class routing and switching as their roots, and they have a lot of service provider um, customers. Network connectivity, network connectivity and application service has been the core of their business. But remember, they saw the fabric early with software and had Contrail that they bought. They were early with Contrail on multi-cloud. 2018, Dave, they were, they were really pushing hard on multi-cloud because Juniper had a lot of the cloud players as customers. So, you know, I wonder if, if Juniper was too early here with software and multi-cloud because Contrail was hot. So, you know, now HPE and with that software pedigree so and Juno West, which started out in 1998, go back uh, to free BSD, but then, you know, NetScreen was bought by Juniper around 2008. They brought their security. So Juno's was upgraded around 2009. So Juniper's got a lot of jewels in the chest there. Definitely. It's got a lot of patent. It's got a really strong patent portfolio. It's got a, it's got a good product portfolio. The other thing, I think you're onto something with, with the, the silicon. Remember, HPE's got silicon shops going back to pre-split. Uh, they've got the Slingshot ASIC, which is out of the, out of the high performance computing Cray business. I'll do another, another sideline, which is amazing. HPE bought Aruba, I want to say it was 2015, John, 2.7 billion. So what an amazing acquisition that's been. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, they, they really didn't talk a lot about GreenLake. And I, if you think about HPE's as a service portfolio, they got compute, obviously, they got that down with their server business. They got Aruba, now they're adding in uh, of Juniper. They got storage, if they, if all they're missing in storage is object store, that's kind of a yeah. big miss with, with as a service, but they will fill that hole. They'll have the entire lower layer of the substrate nailed. And they're ahead in, in that as a service. Now, they probably don't talk about it so much because Wall Street really doesn't care about that, even though I think they should because I think it's going to throw off better margins in the future because you know as a service margins should be better. Uh, but you know I think it strengthens HPE's story there. You know across the basic infrastructure portfolio. Now they can start tucking in, bringing in uh, networking, uh, sorry, and security 
and moving up the stack in data, improving on top of their their Esmeral assets. So, you know, Antonio's making moves. I, I like it. I know a lot of people were criticizing it, but I, I think it makes some sense. Love. I want to hear what uh, the panel has to think. Well, in summary, I love the deal. I think if you look at Juniper's, um, you know, hidden, I would say hidden jewels, I would say they're not really hidden, but not really recognized was their experience with cloud, I think is significant. Their networking and connectivity chops were going to play well at the edge. I think HPE gets a great asset with Juniper. They now have a real play in the service provider market. You know, Mobile World Congress, MWC's coming up, Dave. You know, we're going to be out in Barcelona with theCUBE there, and we'll continue to bring more expertise and analysis to the table. Again, this emergency CUBE is really just to set the table on the news. You know, $40 a share, $14 billion. Hewlett Packard's acquiring in an all cash deal, Juniper Networks, a leader in AI networking. And remember that, you know, the whole hype I hear is AI and all the analysts are like, oh, it's AI, AI. You know, I, I get the missed AI angle here and that's one of the, the core things they're talking about in, this, in, the, in the launch. But I think under the, outside of missed AI, which by the way, we reported on theCUBE years ago, AWS used that reInvent. A lot of people have been using MIST at their events. The wireless technology has been proven to be great. And I think that's a gap we see a lot with Aruba. Um, missed aside, Dave, they got the chops. Routing, switching as their roots, network, connecti network connectivity application services, core competency, software fabric started way early. I mean, Junos was open source again, like I said, in 19, like 1998, upgraded with the acquisition of NetScreen. If you remember the days back then, you know, Junos was a free BSD open source program. NetScreen increased that value to Juniper around 2009 and with their kind of security play there. You know, NetScreen, one of the best acquisitions Juniper's ever did. Um, it was significant, you know, as, uh, in, as in the portfolio. So um, I'm bullish on it. Um, I just want to get the take on the numbers. You think it's good. You think it's good. Yeah, well, it is, I, I think it's good for both sides because where was Juniper going to go? I mean, Juniper had, Juniper had a, you know, TAM expansion challenge. They really kind of, the stock's been sideways for a number of years. I mean, they were obviously a hot company back in the dot-com days as it was every networking company. But, you know, with their Juniper, I mean, where were they going to go from here? So I think the marriage of HPE and Juniper makes a lot of sense. HPE with its services chop and its chops and its green lake capabilities and its go-to-market and its distribution channel, I, I think it's a good move for both companies. I'm a little concerned about, you know, the balance sheet impact. It's an all cash deal. They're going to, you know, take some cash out of their, their till, uh, take on some debt. And I'm not crazy about that, but that's all right. They'll, but you think the numbers look, well, you think the numbers look good. If you go back to that slide again, I think that shows the cash positions, market cap, earnings, that really kind of hits the I, mark I, from your I, perspective. I, my big takeaway is it just improves the quality of HPE's earnings. This is not dilutive. This is accretive to HPE's earnings. You know, HPE, think about HPE and Dell. Dell kept its its laptop business. HPE spun it off with HP. So, so that that's, throws off good revenues for Dell, but it drags down the margins. So HPE should be a higher margin business. That was the whole intent of that spin out. Higher margin, yeah. you know, you know, better growth and they've been struggling to grow. And so they've got to make moves like this to continue to grow. But to me, this improves the overall quality of HPE's earnings. So from that standpoint, I like it. Let's get into it quick, before we get into the panel, I want to just quickly, what are your open questions that you're going to look at? I mean, to me, I'm, I'm looking at the product portfolio overlap. Uh, Antonio Neri, when asked that question, he said, oh, there's no overlap. I was kind of rolling my eyes. Yeah, yeah, mm. <laughs> okay, really? Mm -hmm. We'll debate there's that. Diaz, will have, Diaz Pribala will have a good perspective on our panel on that. Then I asked about the silica, because as we've been reporting, specifically at reInvent and HP, at the HPC event uh, of Supercomputing 23, the role of the chips and networking and um, other chips, IO specifically, this is kind of like a motherboard problem, but it's not the motherboard. It's like, what's the architecture of AI in the future? And what's, the, what's coming up over and over again is that the network component, and we, we saw that at Nitro aspect for AWS, the role of Nitro playing in their architecture. If you look at what HP could do here with networking and silicon to bring that into the compute, GPU, and the TPU side of the business, it up, it's an opportunity to recreate some new configurations at the hardware level, chip level. I think this is something I'm going to be watching very closely. It's the silicon angle, so to speak. We're going to watch that very closely. Uh, that's my take on terms of the questions and of course the team consolidation, how fast can you get that done? But I think the product overlap's not a big deal, but there, it's an issue. And then what's going to be the silicon? How is that going to render itself as a value? 
I, I think the other piece too is is moving up the stack. I mean, if if you're if Green Lake is HPE's cloud, which it is, just like Apex is Dell's cloud, uh, they've got to they've got to have that substrate, that as a service substrate. I think HPE is ahead of of, of Dell in that regard. Um, and, and has done some good work there, but they've got to keep adding services. They, you know, if you think about how Amazon just kept adding services like crazy. Uh, uh, now I'm not suggesting that HPE needs to do that, but they've got to have the baseline, which they're doing. You know, they've announced LLMs as a service. They've got supercomputing as a service. They've got some Esmeral assets in data. I'd like to yeah. see more in data management. They keep tucking in up the stack. This is uh, this is a big move. It's going to take some time to absorb it. I'm really curious to see how it integrates into the whole Green Lake because that's their north star. That's their operating north star. Is everything gets Green Laked, um, and so I, I, I'm curious to see how they're able to yeah. execute on that front. Great data you shared, Dave. That's really timely for this emergency cube. Uh, appreciate that, and uh, the cube research team uh, delivering again. You know, the moment's notice, quick data, quick analysis. Great job on that. Put a quick plug in for the Cube Research. I know uh, you got a lot going on. You're building out, formerly Wikibon now, kind of uh, rebooting and uh, as the Cube as a new name, the Cube Research. Give a quick plug for the Cube Research for the folks watching this might want to hear more. Yeah, we're rebranding uh, the Cube Research, formerly Wikibon, and I think as always, the the Wikibon you know ethos has always been to try to identify new markets to create new markets. I mean, we've done it with SuperCloud, we've done it with software-led infrastructure. We were really early on with the uh, ARMS ascendancy. And they, they're, there are half a dozen examples of, of markets that we created or were early on into, and we're going to continue that trend. Right now, one of our big themes is the sixth data platform. What's the next generation of, of data management look like in, yeah. in real time? We're working with our practitioner audience, we're working with the Cube Collective, which is a, a group of, of really strong independent analysts yeah. and thought leaders. So, you know, we're just combining that insight with the Cube and its amplification capabilities, John, as well as our partnership yeah. with ETR, which is the best enterprise tech survey business, you know, in the in the industry. Well, 13 years of the Cube, everyone loves the knowledge, they love the learning, they love the insights, they love the amplification, love the promotion of the fresh voices, the experts. We're going to keep doing it. Again, a lot more going on. On this emergency pod, we're going to have a reaction right now with a panel of experts to, to dissect the technology synergies between HPE and Juniper, particularly how the combined portfolios lead to innovation in this new AI and cloud native environments. This acquisition is expected to double the rep networking business, creating a formal player. We're going to get the analyst perspective on the implications, the broader market implications, including the impact on the customers and their partners in the channel. And then again, does this position HP to accelerate on the macro trends around AI? We're going to get it all now up next with an expert panel. We'll be right back with that panel after this short break. Hello and welcome back to our special coverage and emergency cube on the big enterprise news. We're delving into the development where HPE Hewlett Packard Enterprise has acquired Juniper Networks for $40, billion, $40 a share for 14 billion. We got a panel reaction from industry experts and analysts, Zs Carvel of ZK Research, Jay Kallenbaugh, who's the managing director of cloud strategies, industry uh, legend, been on all sides of the table. And of course, Steve Mullaney, investor, board member, former CEO of Aviatrix, former CEO of Nasira, early employee at Palo Alto Networks and Cisco, great pedigree in networking on the industry side now investing. And of course, Dave Vellante, co-host of theCUBE, Gentlemen, let's dive in and delve into this deal. Okay, HPE, we've been following their networking, all of us have been for years. HP's had, remember back in the old days, they had switches and hubs and you know, they've had a business. I wouldn't call it jumping out off the page from a value perspective, but Juniper, world-class routing and switching, um, network connectivity, app development, service provider business, pivoted into software, putting those together, almost the same market cap. So let's get into it, guys. What's the take on the deal? Zias, you're in CES, we'll go to you while we have, you have connectivity. What's your quick take yes. on this deal and impact of the industry? You know, speaking of connectivity, actually CES doesn't offer free Wi-Fi. How weird is that? So <laughs> I'm tethered off my phone. Uh, you know, uh, my, my take on the deal is, 
Uh, I understand the rationale, right? If you look at both companies, the stocks have been going sideways and we're both having a tough time uh, growing. I do think between the two, Jupiter probably had some marginal growth potential, you know, maybe low single digits coming up with their enterprise system being bigger. Uh, but it's a, it's a tough industry, right? Networking is, for the last uh, you know, 30 years, has been one 800-pound gorilla and then everybody else is much smaller. And so networking scale matters. And so if you're going to serve the big global companies, uh, Cisco is in the best position to do that because of their size. So if you combine the two companies together, uh, you get, in theory, a much bigger company that can compete with Cisco. With that being said, um, it just, um, it, I don't know, the, the timing of it seemed a little odd to me with the interest rates being so high and, you know, the amount that they paid for it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, overall, um, I understand the rational rationale behind it. I think there's a lot of complexities behind it. And you, when uh, I've never been a big fan of mergers or acquisitions for purely consolidating share, uh, because there's a lot of integration issues, channel issues, customer issues, uh, you know, culture issues. And as you're doing that, the one plus one never comes out to three. Right? It usually comes out to less than two. And so. Um, uh, historically, when we've seen yeah. companies acquire for consolidating share, um, the, the unforeseen problems always come up. And so this comes down to execution, we'll see. But I, I do think there's a lot of bumps along the way. Well, we'll know the Mist and Aruba stuff will work when CES yeah. gets good connectivity and making it free. Yeah. Um, Steve yeah. Mullaney, you know, we talked. I talked about the deal with Dave, forty dollars a share, fourteen billion dollars. He thinks it's accretive. I want to put. We'll get back to the financials in a second, but you know, this the strategic implications behind the acquisition really focus on how it enhances HPE's edge to core strategy. What's your take? Because again, this is like a, the strategic aspects are consolidations happening, but you know, bigger is better here, I guess, from if you look at some of the overlap, it's, it's you know, HP gets some bigger, a bigger box player in service provider. They get maybe better switching and routing, or you know, where do you see that? I mean, Dave doesn't think it's diluted, but I mean, is it strategic in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think AI is really, um, you know, we all know the infrastructure, um, you know, is dictated by what's going on in an application perspective. And I think as AI starts implementing its way into every, every application, it's really taking the infrastructure from a very centralized architecture now in cloud and, and forcing a distributed architecture. And I don't know if HP and Juniper see that. I assume that they do. Um, I know everybody's focusing on the mist, you know, portion of AI, but I actually think there's an even bigger story, which is, you know, um, the world is really moving towards AI and, and 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 pushing it towards the edge, right? And we all know infrastructure is end-to-end -end system, and networking is an end-to-end -end system, and I think we're moving from a very distributed, a centralized architecture to distributed, which is going to put more and more importance on guess what, routing, right? And so multi-cloud, hybrid, edge to core, whatever you want to talk about it, yeah. people are going to need a multi-cloud, hybrid, distributed fabric. Of course, security is going to have to be built into this fabric, right? And it's going to be distributed, which is going to, going to be, uh, you know, high demands on that networking. And that's where I think the property of Juniper can, can really help. I don't know if HP sees that. That's what I see. That's what I would do if I was at HP. Um, sure, MIST is, is fine. They didn't pay $14 billion for MIST, right? Yeah. Or at least they hope they didn't. Um, and so when you look at that, um, I think it's a big opportunity for them. Now, what Zayas just pointed out on a, you know, on a execution perspective, I lived or barely lived through the Synoptics Wellfleet merger. Mergers of equals do not work, right? Yeah. What do you think the first thing the Aruba guys and the Juniper guys in, in networking, they're going to start fighting, right? Like that's just what humans do. <laughs> and there's going to be overlap and there's going to be, you know, a bunch of bureaucrats that are going to be fighting for their territory. And that's going to happen for two to three years. So who's going to win in this? Just yeah. like who won out of Synoptics and Wellfleet merger, Cisco, Arista, yeah. Palo Alto Networks, Aviatrix, everybody else. So I commend them for trying to put strategically this yeah. this narrative together. I think the challenge is going to be uh, execution. Yeah. And I think as always in these situations, it'll be the people that maybe are a little concerned about it right now, Arista, Cisco, Pan, 
but they will act, and um, I think they will be the ultimate benefit from this. Jake, you lived through the CA Broadcom um, acquisition, and you heard Zias' comments. Are we in a different time now? And uh, is that culture fit? I mean, it seems that Juniper and HP got a good culture fit. I would, in my assessment, they kind of do have good cultures. Um, I won't say super fast moving, but I mean, very solid world-class. Um, Jake, you heard the, the comments from Steve on, on this cold battle. I'm, first, I think HP is not calling it a merger of equals. I think they're considering it HP buying Juniper, but to your point about Aruba and, and the, the fighting that could happen, Jake, what's your take on this and your assessment of the acquisition? Yeah, I agree with you that the cultures are probably pretty well aligned, but you know, we've been talking in Silicon Valley a lot about the effect of post ZERP on startups. And I think this is a great acquisition that illustrates post ZERP on public companies, especially public companies that aren't going to be able to create, listen, you can create cash flow for shareholders in two ways. One, you can grow the company through revenue growth, and the other is you can run the business more efficiently and distribute more cash back in the form of dividends or buybacks. Um, you know, clearly, I, I think this is a consolidation play. It's the next crank uh, in the turn of enterprise infrastructure consolidating, especially as more workloads, you know, not only are they being built on the cloud, but they're also being shifted onto the cloud. We're starting to see, you know, cloud workloads go from, you know, what was kind of 20% to, you know, I don't know if it stops 50, 60, 70, 80% of the enterprise footprint, but you know that necessarily means there's there's not a lot of oxygen left to support uh, multiple large public company bureaucracies in the legacy uh, platforms. Um, and so, you know, I think I, I don't see where the growth story comes from here. You know, when you look through both companies' businesses and their relative portfolios, you know, it's kind of zero percent to ten percent growth. Uh, over the next few years, uh, they both identified AI. Um, and I think AI remains a very interesting speculative growth opportunities. Um, and, you know, wondering where that comes from on the infrastructure side. So, you know, I think they're going to have to drive a lot of their economics through synergies. And so this, this feels much more like a Broadcom VMware play than it, than it does somebody who's reaching for the future. Okay, let's, let's, let's unpack that. I think that's a, the key point. Okay, is it a consolidation or is there growth? Zias, Steve, Dave, Jake, what I, I want to like, I I I pick up on something that Steve and Jake both said. I, I totally agree, Steve. There's a big test for Antonio Neri. I think he's up for it. You know, this is, this is a big nut for him to swallow, but I think he's got the experience for it. Um, and I think, Jake, you're right on. This is a consolidation play. But Steve, I, I'm wondering, like, take us inside the board dynamics from both Juniper's perspective and HPE's perspective. If you had to make the case from Juniper's perspective, what, was, what do you think the conversation was like there? And, and flip that, and what was it like inside the HPE board? Well, at Juniper, we're tired. We've had 10 years of no growth. We want out. Right. And probably HPE is on the same side. We've got to do something. We've been irrelevant forever. We're going to be, go into a relevancy. And there's this thing called AI that might be a, a lifeline that we can attach to that maybe can get us out of a relevancy. We've got to do something. Lord knows neither one of them can innovate. Right. That 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 they lost that 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Right. They haven't innovated since Scott Krenz. So, you know, how long can you continue to go with no growth in the stock? Like at some point you got to do something, right? And so okay. I actually think this is, you know, not a bad thing. If I were there, I would turn it into a growth thing, but I think everyone is right. This is a consolidation play, mm -hmm. right? I just think there's an opportunity for the growth play. And I'd be curious, does Antonio see a growth opportunity in this? Maybe, I don't know. Okay, so they justify the deal with a consolidation play. Dave and I just went through some of the numbers. It looks okay. A creative, if they squeeze and crank it, and as Jake says, one, one more, Jake says one more crank of the, of the turn. Okay, growth, where does it come from? I mean, is it, I mean, remember Juniper has had the cloud guys as customers on the big box side routing. You mentioned that, Steve, on one of their cores. They have routing, they said Contrail, which is an early multi-cloud play. Again, super early, maybe too early. Um, they saw the pivot to software. Is this maybe the tail, they are the alphas in this deal with the internal Aruba? I mean, Aruba had great network in the edge, but you know, the, the scuttlebutt was, it wasn't that strong. And there's a lot of, you know, people were, you know, maybe just Reddit people complaining, but you know, most people I talked to were like, you know, some use cases they wasn't delivering. 
What are there gaps in Aruba? Is this a better pitch? Is there an upside with edge, silicon chips, and, and cloud? I mean, I, that's what I would only see as a narrative here. I think, I think for the most part, the, the Juniper products would be the alpha. Uh, I actually think, um, from a leadership perspective, too, you mentioned Antonio, uh, Dave, but I think Rami's the key here, right? So he's going to be, I actually think the structure of having all of networking roll into Rami is the right thing. I think this comes down to, when you do a merger, it comes down to how well you can execute. And the reason they derail, uh, you know, to Steve's point is you might run with a lot of infighting. Rami's a, Rami is a good execution person, right? I, I think he's, uh, he took a company that was largely telco focused, they made an enterprise focused and squashed a lot of the people that, you know, complained in there and brought in new people and bought companies. And Juniper wasn't a very good acquirer pre, pre, pre Rami Rahim. Right. And I think Mist worked pretty well for him. And I think 120T worked pretty well for him. And even Apps, I think, has some a lot of data center chops. And so to me, he's really the key leader in uh, in driving this to, to become a growth story uh, versus one of consolidation and, you know, shedding products and things like that. But I do think from a product perspective, um, uh, I know what you're saying, Steve, about the edge, but I do think Mist really was the uh, the crown jewel in this. And and it'll be what I'm what I'm really interested in is can they take Mist though? And making a broader AI ops platform that could also help with uh, with a lot of the HP compute stuff, and then HP would then become or MIST would become that control point for all things IT that fall into the HP portfolio. If they can do that. They might be able to uh, to, to use MIST as a uh, you know the tip of the arrow to, to, to the more of a platform play, which you know Central never became that. Right? Central was an Aruba product for their networking, and I think. One of the interesting myths they could use to be more of an HP product that across portfolio. So Jake, so to Melanie's point about this consolidation versus growth, I mean, we've seen an innovation. We've seen the consolidation play work for growth companies like Palo Alto Networks, like CrowdStrike. Now they've got innovation as well as their, their tailwind. Do you think that HPE can pull off both either through, as Steve's saying, make you know, AI, a growth engine, they've got the, 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 H, the high performance piece, maybe there's an AI play there, but you can grow through consolidate with the consolidation play, that's the market trend, but you've got to have innovation. What's your take on that? Hey, listen, anything is possible. Um, you know, whether or not it's probable is, is a different question. You know, I think as Steve pointed out, you know, the political war internally between these two organizations uh, around who is going to drive a certain product category versus who becomes redundant um, and who winds up on the synergy list for this combined organization, that's that's not going to be pretty. You know, the, the real politic of how that plays out is is not going to be fun at all. Um, you know, I absolutely think there, there's room for innovation, but when you compare them to a player like Palo Alto, you know, Palo Alto is buying next generation bleeding edge capabilities as, as plugins. And the, the thing that Palo Alto did is broke the mold on integration, right? So the traditional story is that integration of, of emerging, you know, bleeding edge technologies into large platforms, you know, doesn't go well because the people who own the budgets, you know, the SVPs and EVPs who, who run these categories, you know, they don't they did they don't really understand how that business was built and then the innovators you know get fed up and and look for greener pastures and and want to go play the startup equity game so you know i think in theory it's possible i think the reality and in, in how corporations are organized uh make it difficult yeah. and you know antonio's going to have to do something different when he brings these companies together relative than what's traditionally done in large corporate technology bureaucracies yeah. when you have these kind of large acquisitions. The, the talent yeah. question is a good one, like brain drain and then infighting, right? Steve, we brought the infighting up. Yeah. You know, yeah. the reason companies don't innovate, as Jake pointed out, is the talent leaves. I mean, Juniper hired a bunch of Google guys from, from they had the Contrail acquisition. Remember, they had some action going there. Um, what does HP do to stay relevant? Do, I mean, you said they can be, it's okay, but they're not relevant, but how do they become relevant? Does this give them a core to edge? Is it better at the edge? What, did they, what, what do you see if you're, if you're squinting at the deal from a strategic growth perspective? You asking me, John? Yeah. Oh. Well, you and everyone. Yeah, I'd say, I, I, I'd say it doesn't become growth. I'd say what everybody, I agree with everybody what they're, what they're saying. The problem with what they're doing is it's, it's very much focused still on the physical world of, of 
of, of networking, right? Boxes. Guess what? It's shifted from boxes to software and cloud about five years ago. And the problem is neither Juniper nor HP can spell cloud, right? They spell it C-L-O-W-D, cloud, right? Somebody has got, you know, they won't have the growth until they actually start going after where the growth is, which is in the cloud. And you compare it to Palo Alto. When Nikesh came into Palo Alto, he, he pivoted the entire company overnight that said, we're all in cloud. Because before that, they were all on-prem boxes. And they thought, we're fine. We don't need to do this thing called cloud because they spelled it C-L-O-W-D too as well. Nikesh turned that company around and now they're $100 billion market cap with a lot of growth, made a lot of acquisitions. I don't know if HPE sees that. I think they're still in the old world. So you won't see any growth. It'll all be, you know, kind of everything we've been talking about, just, a, you know, a, you know, a, a consolidation play. And we'll fire half the people across, yeah. you know, different organizations. Um, and they'll be focused on that. The growth will come from when they really truly understand that this is a cloud-centric, cloud-first kind of world. If you see that, then maybe then, then maybe you see strategically they get it. If you don't hear anything about that, then it's complete. Okay, so let's compare that to say Cisco's growth strategy. Well, I don't know what Cisco's growth strategy is. Uh, Zia, you know, you're covering both of them. By Splunk. Splunk. And strikes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I would <laughs> say the interesting thing about Cisco's acquisition of Splunk is that Cisco stepped forward into security and it also builds on app dynamics. They are moving up a layer into application and security, right? And so, you know, I give them points for going into the growth direction, you know, still have to execute, still big companies, still have to work it out. You know, the gaps in this deal, uh, big questions I have is, you know, HP's real strength is GreenLake in some sense. And so how does this improve GreenLake? I'm not sure it does, but maybe there's some things they can do with, you know, uh, WAN networking underneath that makes GreenLake more interesting with Juniper. Um, and then- Well, you GreenLake is a bigger portfolio, right? That's, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you yeah. GreenLake, now they got, they got networking sewn up if they GreenLake it, but they didn't talk much yeah. about GreenLake. Because yeah. <laughs> Wall Street doesn't care about GreenLake. <laughs> big platform right now. And, and, you know, we can argue about whether or not that's, how much growth is there. But um, I think the other big gap or big question I have is security, right? So Cisco definitely is driving towards this cloud security, distributed security, security through data. Um, so I, I, th I think they get it, again, have to execute. But I'm curious... You know, I hear Juniper has a lot on the threat analytics side, but that's just one piece in a multi-capability puzzle that they've got to bring together to really drive this networking and security convergence story, which is powerful. Well, there are security assets out there, you know, that that, that you know are ripe for the taking. But to Zias's point, I mean, HPE's balance sheet is you know not that inspiring, and they're taking on more debt in this post ZERP world. It's interesting, isn't it, Jake? You got Splunk and and Juniper, two big post SERP M&A deals. Uh, yeah, but Steve, think, go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to say that I think that the Cisco buying Splunk, you know, everybody knew that was going to happen. They were just waiting for the right, um, they were waiting for Splunk to kind of get up off the floor. And, and so I think they did that. Um, but, you know, the question is, is we're in a new cloud world, as Steve says, and are there enough assets? Are they oriented enough to, to make that shift? And Steve, you know, your point about you would, if you were the CEO, you go after a growth story because that's in your DNA, but that's a, lo that's a lot riskier for a company like HPE yeah. to take on. Yeah. You know, think about it. What they go out and buy an Aviatrix, okay, great. They get innovation, but they don't get the, the revenue hit, right? They don't, they, don't, yeah. they don't get the install base. Yeah. No, I mean, it's like Broadcom, right? Broadcom, you know, from all, of, all my friends at, at VMware, they, they have a very great strategy, which is they take zero zero market and product risk zero if they like version 8.0 of something right and i'm just going to operationalize the hell out of it and it, and hot he's made a great uh business out of all that right so you're right there's certain companies they don't want anything to do with growth they don't want any risk at all right i just want the plus one version eight of something and maybe hp that's what they're trying to do they're buying revenue that's what cisco did with splunk yeah. buy revenue I get a multiple. I've got. I've got to show some growth, yeah. and operationally, I'll I'll make some improvements on. Well, that's a great well, point I mean, about hockey. To your point, they have to do something. I mean, yeah. again, take us inside the board. What What are the alternatives? I you know, I think that basically Antonio stepped back and the board stepped back and said, "Look, the opportunities in networking. We're winning there with Aruba. You know, let's right. double down on networking." Well, 
where else are they going to double down? I suppose security, I suppose data, their data management is sort of meh. So networking seems like a logical place to try well, to I mean, grow. Well, well, one, of the, one, of the, one of the telling data points they gave in the, in the industry analyst call was that uh, the combined company would be 31% of HP revenue, but 56% of, operating profit. Um, uh, yeah. Right. And so networking is a lot more profitable than compute. And I do. I think we are moving into a you know a network central world, obviously, right? Yeah. And so and again, I everything don't, we do is I don't. sorry transforming but... HP from a compute company to a network company is good for HP long term. Yeah. You can argue how they get there or how they should have done it, but that this transition is something I think they need to do. And it's you what's know, your point, Steve? Else is, I was just going to yeah. say if, again, I don't know how much HP really even knows this because they're not really into the cloud world, but. If they're paying attention, the world's going from distributed to, to from from centralized to distributed, and it's not distributed connectivity; it's distributed computing, meaning compute, storage, networking, security with AI. This is not just VPNs to edge locations. This is applications. You're going to run applications. You're going to have computing infrastructure. So if you're HPE, you're like, you should be really excited because that means I'm going to sell boxes out there yeah. and it's going to be running applications and I'm going to need networking and storage and yeah. security because, of course, the security concerns as you now build a distributed infrastructure are even far greater. Yeah. So the demands on this fabric, if you would, and it's not just networking, it's compute storage and networking, computing, which is when I was at VMware, that's what got VMware really elevated when they bought Nasira, they could really now have the software defined data center story, right? Yeah. This could give HP really a story. The problem is they're nowhere in the cloud. So it's, they're, they're, they're only at that edge. They now need to look at the cloud. Actually, right? and that's Juniper, where Juniper, had, the Juniper had Conrail. End-to-end -end and... systems problem. It's I think... not just, Point to point. I think your point about the, the, the cloud, they had a little bit of contrail. They do, they were doing multi-cloud. They were getting in there. That's an open stack action going on. If you remember back, and Randy Bias used to work there. We interviewed on theCUBE. But I want to bring up the point you brought up, uh, Z, it's around margin. Dave brought that up as well. And at, at reInvent, you saw Nitro, the, how networking was so integral in the new architecture. Uh, Steve, you're bringing this up on the multi-cloud uh, scene as well, when you guys are doing at Aviatrix. And then the Hoctan connection kind of brings up another point. Networking is very sticky. So if you can operationalize the HPE and networking, there's not a lot of switching costs here. So it's a very Broadcom-like vibe. Broadcom, you know, they're all about consolidate, make it easier, bundle everything. You want vSphere? No, you can't just buy that alone. You got to buy VCF, which is everything, right? Which includes NSX, right? So, so to your point, I think networking is prime for stickiness. And margin there's, expansion. There's, by the way, that's have that that lock -in, though? First, his first thing that he looks at is stickiness. Uh, exactly. Who are in the room with him? The other thing it, it, about Hawk Tan's model that'll be interesting for Antonio is that he was the guy to make all the calls on what groups and products were going to stick and who would lead what. So he was a, a one man synergy machine. Yeah. And, you know, I know a lot of people who stood in front of him who said he's very, very good at it. Like yeah. he's just, he's perceptually able to figure out who's got the chops and who doesn't and how to operationalize it, as Steve said. So it, it'll be interesting to see how Antonio handles that tactical um, component of the integration in a in a committee-based company. Well, it's a, well you, you guys to agree, your point on the, for, to the former it. point, Jake, does, I mean, the question to the panel is, does Juniper have that type of stickiness and that lock-in, or is it really just sort of a alternative to, to Cisco? I mean, no, I think I think Juniper's got pretty good customer loyalty. I mean, their their customer base is a lot smaller than Cisco's, obviously. But um, <clears throat> through Mist, they have picked up a number of you know really large enterprise customers. They they won Walmart and you know Costco and some other big ones. So they they do have um, uh, you know switching network vendors isn't an easy thing to do. No, it's not. Um, you know, and uh, and so I, you know, I think their stickiness actually is, you know, is pretty good. And they've they've always had good, um, uh, you know, a, a good relationship with the cloud vendors and the service providers. Although those markets are a little soft right now, the the timing of this, you know, is I think somewhat favorable, I guess, financially in that the whole network sector is in a bit of uh, an air gap right now. You know, Cisco warned that a lot of the customers digest, digesting products extreme just. You know, pre-announced as well. You know, Juniper saw they 
you know, said they saw softness. So if HP was going to do this, I guess right now would be a good time because all the stocks are depressed. Um, where if they waited, you know, maybe a year from now and networking came with a little bit of uptick, then you know, perhaps the premium would have been a lot higher. So, well, let's unpack uh, the switching costs real quick. Yeah, Steve yeah. and Zias and Jake, what does it take to switch from Juniper to Cisco? I mean, Steve, you highlighted earlier about your days at Synopsys and Wellfleet that became Bay Networks. I mean, you remember, it's not like you don't unplug a router and then bring in another one. I mean, it's a, the, the, the switching cost bar is high. What is that no, bar to people pay? costs? Nobody's switching, and I think as Zia said, people that are picking Juniper like Juniper, right? Their definition, by definition, they're the ABC, right? Anything but Cisco, right? Yep. So they're never going to, Juniper hasn't been growing now, but I think the people, the customers that are Juniper customers like Juniper, Juniper's always had great product, right? So I, I, can't, I can't see anybody changing. So the consolidation works, they got some stickiness, networking's the core of the edge, they can, this is good for HP from the numbers, the debt can finance it, consolidation play, optionality for innovation yet to be seen, but right. potentially there. Well, Isaiah's point about the debt loads, I think uh, comes into play around how they find growth and innovation because the amount of money they have to commit to interest payments in a higher interest rate world, you know, that comes directly out of BU budgets, right? And so the the ability to find and 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 allocate innovation dollars smartly is also going to be a key capability that Antonio's going to have to figure out as part of this deal. I, I think if there's one bright spot about this, and is that uh, I definitely see a strong. Uh, automation and consolidation through AI story on both sides from Juniper and HP. And if they can bring that together, the continued automation of complex enterprise hybrid enterprise architectures, you know, that is that is a plus. And, and if they can rationalize the different, like I looked through their acquisitions over the last few years and they bought a lot of interesting stuff, the mist and, and some other things on both sides. So I do think if they can figure those product categories out, you know, create some connectivity across the product lines that matters to customers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not sexy, but I think, you know, driving tactical success at that level is one of the ways that they can find success in this deal. G gentlemen, yeah, thank you the... for this emergency pod, um, Cube pod, Cube, Cube broadcast. Appreciate all your time. Thanks for weighing in. Final question, let's end this with a lightning round. Prediction for 2024. Zias, we'll start with you. What's going to happen in networking in 2024 and what's going to happen with this deal? Well, they, they said the deal wouldn't close until the very end of 2024 to 2025. So, uh, you know, I'm guessing it'll get closed sometime, <laughs> you know, but, but I'm guessing later in the year than earlier in the year. Uh, for networking though, uh, it, you know, there are, a, a, what the vendors have said is true. It's, it's uh, a lot of, Customers bought a lot of product or put orders in when there were supply chain issues. They've now taken all their product in, and they do have to consume it, figure out how to deploy it. And I think that this this uh, air gap that we're seeing right now is probably going to last. My guess is at least through the you know through mid year uh, before we start seeing some um, you know uh, you know growth back in networking. We do have another Wi Fi cycles coming up. But the one thing about networking is. You know, the speeds have gotten so high that I think it has elongated um, networks, uh, a network refresh cycles. And so that's, um, you know, that's that's something the members got to work out. Zdias, yes, explain, uh, explain air gapping real quick, what you mean by that uh, term. It's, well, it just, it's just the customers have pre bought a lot of product. Right? When there were supply chain issues, the customers got into a bit of panic. Okay. They had people coming back to the office, they needed to refresh their networks. And so they took in a lot of product and that was reflected in most of the most of the vendor numbers last year, they all had years. Now the customers have this product and they haven't deployed it yet. And so they got to figure out how to consume it, how to deploy it, how to use it. And so now uh, uh, this growth that the vendor has seen that a lot of customers would have paused on things until they can get this, you know, all of the new stuff up and running. And that it wasn't just Cisco saying that. I mean, all the network vendors have said that. So. Jake, your predictions for 2020, what does this do to the industry landscape? Even though the deal's going to close into the year, obviously it's going to set the, set the set it, flip a bit in the industry. You know the consolidation play, you saw Broadcom, CA, you've advised, you've invested. What's your take on networking? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we'll see more of this. Um, you know, I have to think about kind of the remaining players, but 
Um, you know, this this deal feels like it sits in between Cisco Splunk and Broadcom VMware. And, and so, you know, I think you, the bigger getting bigger uh, and it becomes about operational execution. Um, and I think it, to make this deal successful, I think Steve's right. You know, they have to figure out how to incorporate cloud and, and really make the hybrid cloud story a reality versus just being kind of a hardware layer that, you know, could ignore cloud up until now. Dave, what's your take? Well, I think from a customer standpoint, customers want to simplify their, their vendor list and for no reason that they want to, actually as Steve was saying, they want to do some innovation. They want, they want to you know, <laughs> tap some of the new wardrobe and, 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 and prune some of the old wardrobe. And so I think networking, the prediction is networking and, and security are going to, going to collide this year in a bigger way. And, and I do think the, the rich get richer. You're going to see some, some pickups and some M&A in and, and security and, and networking. And uh, I think that's probably a good thing for customers so that they can innovate on some new stuff. Change that wardrobe. Never fight fashion, Dave, right? You don't want to wear fight the fashion. 70s outfit in the 80s. Right? It's punk rock, it's punk rock. Steve, what's your take on uh, the deal um, my, and the impact uh, of the industry? My prediction is this will be the year of cloud networking, and no surprise there. Um, I think HPE and Juniper are not dumb. They're going to figure out that this is the, this is the piece they're missing. Um, I think Cisco's already figured that out. I think Arista even will figure that out. That's, you know, it's, it's no longer about boxes in the campus at the edge or in the data center. That There's no growth there, right? So you're talking single digit growth or you're fighting someone to do market share replacement, which is a bloody battle. No one really wins because it's really hard. No one ever rip it, rips and replaces their network. It's just not done. So I think they're going to figure that out. And then I would also say, don't don't count Palo Alto Networks is going to truly become what their name says. Palo Alto Networks is not a networking company. They're going to need to become a networking company because network security must be integrated into the fabric of the network and not a bolt-on like it was in the last generation. When you're in the cloud, it's not a separate thing. It's all together. It's got to be integrated in. So I think it's going to be a okay. battle royale. You know, you've got my old my old company, Aviatrix, leading leading this, right? And it's a great opportunity for them as well as some of the incumbents. And I think that's going to be the battle this year. I have to get. Sounds one like more. you're predicting a Palo Alto Aristotle. <laughs> well, that's why you, I got to get one more question. You guys just prompted another one in my head. I got a prompt engineering go, thing going on in my head. Okay, quick final question. Final final question impact of the boardrooms of those other guys. Cisco, you mentioned Arista, you mentioned Palo Alto. They see this news, what's the huddle? What's the slides look like? What's that conversation that's boiling over right now at Cisco, Arista, Palo Alto, or competitor? I think for competitors, it's up on the gas. So whenever, if you look at some of the comments, Reddit, and even there was an Aruba customer on my LinkedIn post that said he's got some concerns. As long, if there's uncertainty, that gives the competitors the opportunity to jump in there and try and you know feed off that uncertainty. And so if I'm in the board of the competitive companies, I'm uh, I'm I'm jumping all over this and trying to feed the fud uh, that's likely you know you know being created or, or at least the concern the customers have. And by the way, we talked about Palo Alto. I think Fortinet has done a really good job of adding you know uh, networking to their portfolio as well. They're they're one of the big SD-WAN vendors, and I, I just don't want them to go unnoticed in this, because I think they've got a, a pretty big stake in this convergence and everything security as well. Steve. I think they, Cisco's got its hands full. <laughs> 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 they, they got a lot going on, so I don't think they're they're going to get too distracted by this. I think is yeah. interesting. I think, you know, J3's got great growth engine going on, but, you know, at yeah. some point, they're going to have to continue on TAM expansion. And uh, that brings up some opportunities that we we talked about in M and A, but you know they can be selective right now. Well, they're smaller enterprise, right, Dave? So that that's where their big growth engines is, is becoming more of an enterprise yep. player. And they, Absolutely. They, they they don't jump into things without thinking it through, and they're they're really a well-run company. So, what's the board Indeed. like, Steve? Jake, take a stab at that at all? Yeah, yeah I would just say you know you know. You just mentioned uh, Pan and, and, and Arista, you know, um, and Jay Shu's done a fantastic job, but you know, her market cap 75 billion. Let's, let's yeah. not forget, it's That's not huge. 15 billion anymore. It's huge, 75. Right? Yeah. It's huge. How are you going to go to 150, right? And if you're and if you're Pan, how are you going to go to 200 billion? You're a hundred billion dollar market cap right now. How are you going to go 200? You ain't going 200 by getting another 10% of the security industry, right? So they're going to have to make big moves and they're going to have to go after, you said TAM expansion, John, right? They're going to have to go after industries 
And, you know, the, both of those people are going to be looking probably at HPE and saying, you know, what, maybe we ought to be doing something like that. We've, we're going to have to go after the entire infrastructure market and not just either networking or, or security. We're going to have to do probably all of it. Yeah, you know. So, and by the way, yeah. compete with the cloud vendors, right? So the cloud platforms, you know, Steve, you brought it up. The uh, networking in the cloud is becoming a big deal, and they, and they're starting to create their own, uh, you know, enterprise cloud plat cloud networking platforms. So how to create relationships and how to create compelling value for customers relative to those cloud guys um, and make sure that they can stand on equal footing, I think is an imperative for all the traditional infrastructure players. Gentlemen, a great conversation, exceptional analysis, um, the best on the industry I've seen out there. Uh, clearly you guys are awesome and thanks for being part of our CUBE community. Again, um, real time news going down. Really appreciate you taking the time to, to pop into the CUBE, emergency CUBE, appreciate it. Thanks John. All right, guys, thanks so much. Again, thanks, breaking news thanks, here. We're on it with the analysis from theCUBE Research and its community, the Cube Collective. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante and guests on the panel. Thanks for watching and keep in touch.